Well, Entity Framework is going to make that pretty easy. I can just call on the DB context and get all books and then just as a super simple example, not something that would scale very well, just to return all the books and enumerate them to a list. So let's say we have a million books in the system. Uh, keep in mind that this will get called in the context of a single HTTP request and uh, we have to think about the fact that that would return just a massive amount of data if we have that many books in the system. And so what we would do here for um, managing that complexity is uh, typically introduce some type of pagination. That's going to be outside of the scope of this simple example, uh, but just to present the idea, this is how we might return all the books from the system. Next, how might we get a single book by ID? Well, Entity Framework makes this a little bit too easy as well. We can say books.find and then book ID. There are other ways to get the um, get the uh, a single book by ID here, which are a little bit more verbose. Um, I'll just put them here as an example. Um, we might say our book is equal to db dot first, and then we can't pass book ID to first here. But what we can do is we can use a lambda syntax to say, hey, from that from all of those books, get the first book such that the book.id is equal to the book ID that was passed to this method. So that essentially does the, the same thing. Um, there's something to note here, which is the difference between first or first or default. First or default will return uh, the default value for books, and it, it's an object, so it's going to return null. Um, first will throw a null reference exception if there is no matching ID. So it's really up to you um, which of these, if you find yourself in a situation um, you'd like to use. If you'd rather, um, if you'd rather deal with the null in, with using some business logic, or if you'd rather wrap uh, first in a try catch and handle the exception, um, kind of depends on your preference and particular application. Find is um, essentially like using first or default in that a null value will get returned if no particular value is found. Okay, how are we going to add a book? Well, this service method is receiving a book data model, and so what we'll do here is we can say db.add book, and Entity Framework is smart enough to know that this book by its type belongs in the books table, and then we're going to call this save changes. So Entity Framework under the hood is implementing a combination of the repository pattern and the unit of work pattern. And just as a high level summary, basically anything that's going to happen within the context of adding, changing, updating results, doing typical CRUD operations on uh, the various entities that are being tracked, um, those are going to happen within the scope of a unit of work. So uh, Entity Framework is going to track all of those changes, but it's not until we call save changes that it handles actually running those transactions um, against the particular data store that we're working with. Okay, and how would we remove a book? Well, let's say that we just want to find the book by its ID. So I'll say book to delete is equal to this book by ID. And then let's say if book to delete is not equal to null, and we can say db.remove book to delete. Okay. Otherwise, I mean we could we could do lots of different things here. Let's just throw an exception can't delete book that doesn't exist. So this is all um, a bit oversimplified. Obviously there may be more complex business logic that you'd like to handle in here if uh, your application were to grow to any level of uh, additional complexity. So here we have some very basic behavior that has been implemented in our book service. And the particular behavior that a book service needs is defined by our interface iBook service. Now let's take a step back and let's actually get our database wired up so that we have these actual tables to work with and then we can actually start making 
um, use of the service that we created in our web layer. So I'm gonna go ahead and minimize everything we have here. Then down in our web layer, we need to open up this app settings.development.json file. So what we're gonna do is, well, you can see there's some configuration here for some logging. I'm gonna add a section called connection strings and it's gonna have a single key with goodbooks.dev and then we've got to make sure that the connection string looks exactly like this. If it's formatted incorrectly, then we're going to have issues connecting to our Postgres database. So we're going to say host is localhost, port 5432, username will be goodbooks, password will be emerson, and database will be goodbooks.dev. Okay, so what's going on in this file, you might ask. Plus, why is there an app settings and an app settings.development file? Well, when we launch our application, .NET has many different ways we can use and collect configuration for our application. One of the ways it can do that is through the use of JSON files. So as long as these are valid JSON, uh, .NET can reach into them and essentially parse them and grab whatever it need, whatever type of configuration you might need for your app. So whether it's logging configuration, connection strings, you might put configuration for external APIs in your configuration files, um, configure things like caching if you're using Redis or memcached. I mean, there's just like, I mean, just any configuration you might have in your app in general can go in these files. And then out of the box, .NET can um, parse the syntax of the file name here. And depending on the type of deployment you're doing, you can overwrite your app settings.json with the development or testing settings or production settings. And so think of app settings.json here as sort of the, uh, the base configuration. And then anything defined in some subsequent environment configuration will overwrite those app settings. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what we want to do now is we want to create this database good books dev and I want to create a user good books that has uh, basically root access to that um, the, this goodbooks.dev database. And for that, I am going to use the psql CLI. So we can just type psql. This should give you access to a, a command line interface that looks like this. Yours may say Postgres or it may say your username. And the command that I'm gonna type here is create user. And we're gonna name this user good books and then we can say with password and here we'll use single quotes here and we said the password would be emerson and then a semicolon to terminate the statement here so you'll notice that we get this create role back out and then we're going to say create database and we need double quotes here because we have a dot here we're going to say goodbooks.dev and so we should see that the database has been created. And then I'm going to make a command that says grant all privileges on database goodbooks.dev to goodbooks. And so we should see grant here out on the terminal. So now this means that the user goodbooks with password Emerson has uh, complete control over this goodbooks.dev database. And we're going to use this essentially as our user agent in our application to, uh, you know, have those interactions with the database. So we're going to be adding and removing records, for instance, and doing updates, running migrations, and that sort of thing. And we'll be doing it on behalf of this goodbooks user uh, because we've defined that, um, that particular connection here in our connection string. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a quick look into this properties directory. Notice that we have this launch settings.json file, and there's a few things in here. There is this uh, profiles key, for instance, which has this IIS Express object in it. Um, it says launch browser true, launch URL weather forecast. Um, this is where we might want to have a particular profile where we don't necessarily launch the browser. We certainly don't want to use this launch URL uh, with weather forecast that we deleted. And so what I'm gonna do is say false here and then launch URL. We don't even need to launch at a particular URL. The application URL will run on 5001 and 5000 depending on the protocol. 
and the development environment um, will be what we're using. And so that's what's going to kind of hook into our development.json. So this will actually overwrite anything that we have in app settings.json. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this open. And if I run a debugger in my IDE, which would be done by sort of right clicking here and saying debug, I can see some of those configurations here. I can see this launch profile and I'm gonna select this goodbooks.web that we just updated. And I'm not gonna change anything else here. Let's just see if this works when I select debug. So that seems to be working. We should now be able to hit localhost 5000 um, and that's still working, that looks good. Um, so what this is going to allow us to do is to um, set breakpoints in our code. So for instance, if I head over into our controllers again, books controller, and I set a breakpoint right on this get method here when we're about to return okay, and I just refresh the page, this will send another get request. We'll actually hit our breakpoint, and so the execution has been paused here, if you will, um, and this is going to allow us to inspect the various variables come in very handy when you're debugging your API if you're using an IDE like Visual Studio or JetBrains. Cool, so we are moving along now. We have uh, some services set up. We have a um, connection string set up to wire in our database. Now we just need a way to actually uh, create that database through database migrations. So we're gonna head into startup.cs. And right under services.addcontrollers, we're going to add a, an expression services.addDBContext with our good books DB context. And then we'll use this lambda to specify some options. We're going to enable detailed errors and we're going to use npg SQL with the connection string goodbooks.dev. So this configuration object has this convenient get connection string method on it, which is going to target. Um, whatever key we pass here. And so we've set that up in our app settings.development.json. So you're just gonna wanna make sure that it matches this key. And we need to now add some dependencies to our web project to actually uh, wire in um, both um, Postgres as well as uh, Entity Framework Core itself. So I'm gonna bring in Microsoft at Entity Framework Core with the same version. I'm going to bring in Entity Framework Core Tools as well, and Entity Framework Core Design. The next thing that I'm going to bring in is a package called Newtonsoft.json. This is a, a very old, I should say, I guess, um, package that's been around for a long time. It's it's really the de facto standard for dealing with JSON in .NET Core at the time of this, uh, this particular recording. You'll find it in almost any web project that you come across. And for now, I think that will be all that we actually need. Oops, um, I'm mistaken, we need one more thing, which is uh, we need to bring in that NPG SQL. So NPG SQL Entity Framework Core Postgres. That's going to give us access to this use npg sql extension. And then finally we need to make a reference to our data project. Likewise we'll need a reference to services. So I'm going to um, map both of those at the same time. I'm going to make our import here. And I'll scroll up just so you can see the imports that I'm using. I'm going to clean up the ones that I'm not using. And so now you can see I'm referencing the data project. We're using uh, ASP.NET Core, uh, Entity Framework Core, Configuration, Dependency Injection, and this extensions.hosting. So this should be sufficient to actually um, wire up a connection to our Postgres database and add that DB context using the uh, connection string that we have provided. Now, .NET Core has some various command line uh, utilities for doing things like running migrations and updating our database. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of psql here with control D. 